now? Yes, we can see. Thank you. Okay. So just to reiterate, um, infection um, assessment is based on the cardinal signs and symptoms of inflammation, uh, heat, redness, pain, swelling, and discharge. Um, we need to consider the vascular supply. If patients got a reduction in their vascular supply, you may not get overt signs and symptoms of inflammation. The duration of the lesion, uh, the longer the wound has been there, the more likely it is that a patient will develop infection. The appearance of the wound, if there's necrosis, maceration or smell. Any changes in size, such as an increase in size or a stopping in progress. And then we need to consider the depth of the wound, if there's underlying joint or deep tissue involvement or bone or leading to potential uh, consideration for osteomyelitis. And finally, the presence of pus. So this is a classically infected foot where you can see um, the redness is probably quite warm. Um, there's some swelling there and there's probably some discharge. So we've got the cardinal signs and symptoms of inflammation. We know that infection should be diagnosed on the Infections Disease Society of American guidance. And we know that you should consider the infection severity, the most likely infecting pathogen, any known resistance patterns, and Clear and importantly, however, consideration should also be given to the bioavailability of the drug, particularly in patients who are poorly perfused. So if somebody has poor circulation, the use of oral antibiotics may be reduced or the efficacy of the oral antibiotic may also be reduced uh, due to that poor perfusion. As a result, we are seeing the, the use of topical antimicrobials becoming more popular. And this is due to the increase in antimicrobial resistance where, as I've just described, antibiotic tissue penetration is difficult, and where there are no signs and symptoms of infection, but the clinician spit, uh, suspects bacterial bioburden or biofilm. If we're going to use an antimicrobial product, we need to have these uh, considerations. It needs to have a broad spectrum of kill, rapid and sustained action, and as, as Philippe has, has just described, it needs to be non-irritant, non-traumatic, non-toxic. I think easy to apply, manages other wound symptoms such as an increase in exudate or we may need to debride um, necrosis and equally needs to be cost effective. Important in modern wound care management is the management of biofilm. I'd just like to touch on that before I move forward. We know that biofilms exist in chronic wounds. And we know that around 95% of bacteria exist in biofilms. Evidence has shown that 80% of persistent bacterial infections exist as biofilms. And biofilms attach and form um, um, within wounds um, with regards to a, uh, this film, which causes attachment and is difficult to remove. So, but they also attach to biotic and abiotic surfaces. And why are biofilms sort of becoming popular over the last three to five years? Uh, people weren't looking for them, and other explanations were given, such as deep infection. And equally, we didn't have appropriate sampling or view me viewing methods. So if I was going to describe a foot that had a biofilm, remember we can't see a biofilm uh, with the naked eye, but this is what you would potentially look like, where you can see the effects of the biofilm, where you've got this discoloration, the granulation tissue, there's localized maceration, the granulation tissue is friable, and the wound is stalled and not moving forward. There's no overt signs and symptoms of inflammation in terms of heat, redness, pain, or swelling, but the patient has a bacterial burden which is stalling the wound from healing. So the principles of biofilm management are to reduce the biofilm burden and prevent reconstitution of the biofilm. And as I described, the biofilm may reform by growth of fragments being left behind after debridement, a spread of planktonic bacteria released from remaining biofilm, and the growth of new biofilm by newly introduced microorganisms. As Philippe has described, we know that flaminil has that efficacy against biofilm formation. And we can see from this slide from Rose Cooper that we can see that it has an activity against biofilm. If we move on from infection and consider sort of the wound management elements, and um, again, Philip touched on this in the TIME acronym, where we think about M in time as moisture imbalance. And we need to think about it as potentially a, 
a, a seesaw rather than a jigsaw, if you like, where we've got uh, maceration at one end, where there's increased infection risk. Um, you get this altered mechanical tolerance of the tissue due to the maceration of the tissue. And you also get this inhibitory action of chronic wound edge state, which can cause damage to the peri wound and can cause low grade inflammation, which reduces the, uh, the chances of wound healing. On the other side of the seesaw, we have desiccation, where the wound's drying out and causes a reduction in epithelial advancement. So we think about moisture balance in terms of, of, of trying to get an appropriate moisture balance where the wound's in the ideal scenario for healing. So I've just chosen a picture here where the, the main problem with managing this wound and stopping it progressing was the effect of moisture. If we can look at the wound there, it's a dehist um, surgical wound following an amputation of a hallux. And you can see the maceration, the peri wound damage there associated with the wound edge date not being effectively managed. And if you look at the two dates on the pictures, we can see that the, there is only really two weeks between these two pictures. And the difference between the two pictures is that we started to effectively manage the edge date by the second picture. And the wound progressed through healing very quickly once we did this. We can also see from this wound where we used flaminil in the other end of the um, spectrum where the wound has become necrotic and dried and as, uh, it was, the eschar needs to remove. This foot was too painful to debride and the patient had painful neuropathy. So we've described predominantly before around the loss of sensation associated with neuropathy, but some patients can develop this altered sensation which increases pain. And you can get this unfortunate scenario where you get the painful, painless foot where they can damage the foot without realizing it, but equally they've also got painful symptoms. So this patient couldn't be debrided effectively with a, a sharp debridement, a scalpel, and was debrided using flaminil. And you can see there after two days, we've got that reduction in the necrosis and an exposure of the wound bed. And by day five, we've got that significant improvement where the wound is in the scenario of a of, of clean and granulating wound. And that's there about managing the moisture balance between necrosis at one end and uh, desiccation, and also at maceration and excoriation at the other. Just to uh, talk you through a further case study, this was a, a lady of ours at the, um, working in Manchester who'd had an above knee amputation but also had a renal pancreas transplant in 2006. And as a result, was classed as sort of non-diabetic. So their HbA1c was in normal range. But they had all the consequences of had, having diabetes for over 15 years, to, uh, 20 years rather. They were also immunosuppressed as a result of the pancreatic uh, immunosuppressant drugs. So unfortunately, the patient burnt the posterior heel whilst on hot tap while on holiday. They lay in a bath and had a, put their foot, it was neuropathic, and put their foot on the hot uh, tap. They developed a 40 by 30 millimeters sloughy necrotic wound with an associated cellulitis. We agreed a low dose antibiotics with the transplant team and we started flaminil and applied it every two days. The cellulitis resolved within five days and therefore we stopped the antibiotics and just continued with the flaminil to manage the infection, but also debride the wound and maintain the moisture um, balance. Um, the patient had um, hypertension, poor renal function, um, and immunosuppressant drugs are also associated with osteoporosis and recurrent urinary tract infections. So this was the, the, the time scale for this, this treatment. And this was my colleague, Samantha Haycox, from, uh, who I work with at Salford. And this was the wound that I described in, on the before picture where they uh, put their foot on the hot tap. You can see the burn and the necrosis there. Um, this was unable to be debrided using sharp debridement. There was uh, an element of cellulitis, as I described. We used a short dose of antibiotics. And this was some 26 weeks later, the patient did not require admission. Um, the patient was fully healed and managed as an outpatient over this 26 week period. So just to finish off, just to um, go through finally, one of the, the biggest concerns around diabetic foot management is the delay sometimes in patients being seen and having an effective management. We know that um, Chris Manu found that in four countries in Europe, uh, delayed diagnosis and delayed referral was common. 
And we have to consider why people do not access specialist care. There's often the lack of availability and access to a multidisciplinary team. But crucially, there's also a lack of education of, of clinicians. And this is common across the world um, about how to manage effectively a um, diabetic foot ulcer. We often have this scenario where people are working very hard in different elements of the healthcare system, but not doing very much benefit for the patient. So often the weakest link is the person who first sees that patient with a diabetic foot ulcer and treats the patient ineffectively by, by, by not being able to make an appropriate diagnosis and management plan. Within the UK, um, we've developed, and working with our colleagues in DFOOT International, um, we've developed this diabetic foot rescue pack, um, working with um, FLEN. And what we've described is an educational package for our practice nurses and our district nurses, our community nurses and community podiatrists called Pass It On. The emphasis being on pass on the wound to the multidisciplinary team. Well, it gives them some algorithms about how they should manage the patient from a presentational point of view, what to do, what kind of assessment to undertake, what kind of specialist referral and how this needs to be done, whether it needs to be done immediately or within one to two days, as according to our NICE guidelines. And finally, try and solve any problems such as what the causes of the ulcer is, such as a tight shoe or a burn, for example, and treat any infection appropriately. And really what's key for this is addressing that they can put on and put before they refer on to um, the multidisciplinary team. And with this, we've developed an, um, a pathway where realistically um, flaminil can be used in all these presentations. So within the diabetic foot rescue pack, we provide some flaminil for the district nurse or the community nurse or the first responder so they can use a dressing that they feel comfortable with, with no matter what presentation it, it has. So this is this is where we use this this uh, this this tool of the uh, diabetic foot rescue pack. So to conclude, and I know probably gone on off over a few minutes due to the uh, technical issues, but we know that DFUs are complex and uh, um, costly to patients and healthcare systems alike. There is no universal model of care, but we need to consider how we manage patients effectively in the first instance and how we pass <laughs> on this care to people who are appropriate. And we need to adopt a holistic approach with the use of multidisciplinary teams. Uh, that's my contact details, and I'm happy to share the slides afterwards th uh, through Flen and, and my email address if anybody wishes to contact. And I'll move swiftly on to the next speaker, and then I'm, I will stay on the call to answer any questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Paul, for this uh, very nice and very interesting cases.